What is up, my beautiful people? You know, this is one of those times where I regret saying all those other times that, hey, I've got this interesting story for you because this is my story and I'm biased. This is the story of me, my past, what I did before this life, and the decisions I made that led me up to this moment now. If you're interested in that, I recently sat down with Andy H. from the Ocean Cruisers podcast, awesome guy. And you know how when you meet those kinds of people that you just feel comfortable with, you just spill the beans and tell the true story? That was this instance. It's probably too revealing for YouTube, but whatever, it's my story and it's the truth. Really quick before we get started, if you want to hear the audio version of this, it'll be up on my podcast, the Between Two Sheets podcast, and Andy's podcast, the Ocean Cruisers podcast, right here and right here. All right, last thing, promise. A lot of work goes into these podcasts. There's countless hours of editing and post-production and videoing and lighting, pre-production, video gathering, intro making, voiceovers, all that stuff put together makes it into a job. And the only way that Andy and I can keep doing this job is through people like Stan, Des, Graham, Joe, Steve, all my patrons that help me along the way and help make these videos possible. If you'd like to join our patron family, you'll have access to my personal WhatsApp group where we have a weekly Zoom call and have a lot of fun. And that's all accessible through this link, www.patreon.com slash svzingaro. And also Andy, if you'd like to support Andy and the Ocean Cruisers podcast, his link is right here. Go out, support him. I'm a patron of his. He's an awesome guy. He's doing some cool stuff. It's very interesting. And you know what? If you don't want to support either one of us, support your favorite creator. That's all I'm saying. We absolutely cannot make this happen without you guys. So thank you very much to all my patrons. Without further ado, let's just get into it and you can hear the story of me, James, the man behind Zingaro. Love. So you play guitar and drums, man. We need a jam. I play guitar too. Yeah, yeah, guitar and um, drums. I did guitar in one band. That was like a Sabbath, Zeppelin, Deep Purple type of tribute band. Um, I, love it. I played drums in my own band, and that was like I, I did. I, I wrote some of the riffs for it, so it was kind of like um, a, you know, Tool, the band. Oh yeah, I love Tool. That's one of my favorite bands. Oh, same, right? Yeah. So uh, my like favorite drummer is Danny Carey out of Tool. So yeah, in the um, in the uh, band where we wrote our own music that was like heavily inspired by like two nowhere near as good obviously because i wouldn't be doing this if it was you know i'd be i'd be a millionaire <laughs> making music I, I was a singer in a tool tribute band i was maynard man that's hard being a singer in a tool tribute yeah band. we weren't that good either <laughs> yeah that's that's <laughs> or else i'd be making millions right but, <laughs> almost be quite let, hard on the vocal cords do you know ronnie james dio then right yeah of course yeah i his keyboardist, his name is Claude Schnell, and I was in a band with him okay. in L.A. And, uh, you know, he was in his 50s at that point, but he was a he was an amazing pianist. He had an 1886 Steinway D at his house and oh, nice. he like took it all apart for me. And um, really cool story, actually. Uh, the, the piano tutor came over one day when we were practicing and we had to stop and I was talking to him and he was an old guy, didn't use any equipment, just use his ear. And he said, be, any instrument that you have that's open, that's wood, um, all, all sound waves depreciate by half-life. And yeah. um, those sound waves never really go away. They're just imperceptible to your ear now. But like, if, if you think about it, the energy that is still bouncing around inside that instrument of all the people that ever owned it. So when people say that instruments have an energy, it's, it's absolutely true. And this is why. I was like, yeah, well, the molded what? by what you play in them as well. Like, especially with anything that's made out of wood, um, anything string, piano, anything like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it changes the way that they actually play. So, yeah, it's important. I didn't know you were a rocker, mate. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know you were either. We had to jam if we ever meet up. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be in the Caribbean eventually, one day. Well, it'll be in the future. Be, we've got a plan. And, yeah, part of this is part of the plan. That's uh, get, getting what is it? finish now and underway. Well, we've You're basically on a moody, right? sold it. Yeah. So, well, what we've got now, it's like, I mean, to be honest, man, we could circumnavigate in that boat. It's strong. It's a moody 34. Um, but yeah, yeah we've got boats. like kids. And, yeah. Yeah. They're solid, mate. They're really good. Um, but yeah, we've got like kids and a couple animals and we're going to do charters for like making money as we, so we're going to like circumnavigate and like do like a, probably like 10 weeks of chartering, but like exclusive type of 
charter it in nice locations, like teach people how to sail and maintain engines and all that type of shit. And um, yeah, so we're going to get a bigger boat for that. I just um, had an interview with and met um, Ryan from Sail Libra. Have you ever heard of him before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he'd be a good resource for you if you could do something like he does. Mm. Yeah, that's the intention. Um, I mean, we figured out if we can do about 10 weeks of chartering, that will basically give us enough cash to just like cruise all year and maintain the boat, which we're pretty happy with. We've done the uh, we've done the corporate stuff and we're sick of it. So, yeah, we're just ready to like chill out now. But um, yeah, so anyway, we've we've always like done up houses. And this last one we got in Spain was just way too big. It was way too big of a project. And I was always intending and working and then doing it part time. But I just can't. So this year I'm stopping work and I'm just getting the house finished, but it's like a mental amount of work to do. So <laughs> I've got my work. Yeah, you said, I mean, we were supposed to start this half an hour ago and you had a busted pipe. Uh, That's so funny, man. It's like, just like my boat. <laughs> it's the same. Thing. It's the same. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. This Are boat, you flipping this boat, houses? Uh, yeah, we have done in the past. We stopped like last year. So um, yeah, last year we sold like the last two that we flipped with. And um, yeah, we're just holding on to the cash now which I don't even know is a good idea. Like what's going on with the economy in the world is just crazy at the moment. So like, I don't know. Some people are saying buy gold. Other people are saying like buy Bitcoin. I'm like, I have no idea what to do with this. So I'm just going to keep it on me. Hope inflation doesn't kill us. We'll see. Yeah. Just, just live yeah. your life, man. Yeah. That's, that's just trying to forget about it all. Um, so yeah, we've got like probably about a year's worth left of um, doing this up and just getting stuff ready. And then we're going to head off. We're going to get like a bigger Geno and uh, bugger off. I'd love to get like a 50 foot Moody, but I also need about a million dollars for that. So <laughs> that ain't happening. My buddy's on a 54 Geno and those are really nice boats. I mean, I love the Moody. That's what we're going to get. Too. Yeah, those are great boats, man. Do it. Yeah, that's that's what we're aiming for. The uh, Geno 54 DS. It's just, you know. Yeah, it's that's like, the boat. It, yeah, yeah. They're, they're really good, man. It's like. You know, they moved away from custom into more of like a heavy production type of model for their like, you know, flagship top line, which is like 54 DS. Now they do like a 53, 57, I think, something like that. Um, but they've maintained like some really good quality features that you'd get with a proper blue water cruising boat, um, like the shape uh, shape of the hull, um, the way the furniture is put together inside the deck. Like it's a good boat. Like they are, they are good. Yeah, man. My thought on that is just sail it until you break it. Doesn't matter what kind of boat, as long yeah. as you, as long as you're happy with it and it's comfortable for you, just just rock it, man. It's a toy, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's the plan, man. So yeah, hopefully, I think we're going to be in the med for about four years, and then we're coming over to the Caribbean. I don't know how long we're going to spend in the Caribbean. We'll just have to like see what life throws at us. Um, but yeah, then circumnavigate. Definitely going all the way around getting into the, into the Pacific need to see some of those little islands and um, yeah, through Asia, all that stuff. Can't wait. That's where life starts. Yeah, man. I mean, you've got enough. I see, I was checking out your podcast and you've met some of like the coolest sailors. So, a lot of them are my friends and yeah, you know, no, any, yeah. and you've got such a good resource there. All you have to do is just call and be like, Hey, yeah, this is Andy. Uh, I'm going here. What do you think? And then they'll be like, Oh yeah, go here, 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 here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. You know, like one one philosophy that we've got when we're going into this is like, I do not want to leave any country that we go to until we have been to like every single anchorage, seen every monument or statue, whatever there is. Because like if I go on Instagram like two years later and someone's posted a photo of an anchorage in like, you know, Antigua that I've not been to, I'm going to be like, shit, we have to go back because that was nice and we didn't see it. So, <laughs> so that's the idea. Create like a mega list and see everything. Yeah, I love it. Do it. Yeah. yeah. Sounds so, cool. right, we need to we need to talk about your story. Um, okay. And sure. What what you've done with with your life quite a bit. Uh, you've had a pretty exciting one. So, um, right, right back to the beginning. Because um, what I find is when when I speak to people who listen to the podcasts, they are super interested in like your lifestyle and how you've got there, but they want to know like the details of how you actually made this life happen. Because most of them are inspiring to do the same type of stuff that you do. Um, okay. So yeah, it would be great to know like what type <clears throat> of person you were before you actually got into this, and then what encouraged you to get into it, um, and like what life changes you had to make. All this type of stuff is really interesting to people. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, keeping keeping so, that in mind, it's gonna it's a little bit of a long story, but I'll give you the whole thing. That's good, man. 
Yeah, go for it. Um, I was born in Washington State, but my father is from Santa Monica, California, and mm-hmm. I feel like I was born to be a beach bum, but I was born in the wrong spot. And every, <laughs> every time he would fight with my mom and be like, boy, pack your shit. We're leaving. We're going to Santa Monica. I'd be like, yes. And then yeah. they'd, they'd always make up. And, and I didn't get to go to Santa Monica. And so when I was I wanted to get out, man. And I when I was 17, I left and I was just a dipshit for about a year. And then I went in the Navy and the Navy really like shaped me as a man. It kind of like tra- it was my transition from boyhood to adulthood and they gave me like a good place for some role models and stuff, which I needed. It, it, it taught me a lot. So I think the Navy was like the linchpin of this life for me. Um, I've always kind of been a presenter. Like I, I would do shows and stuff for my parents and my, my neighbors and stuff like that. So maybe that's got something to do, to do with it. But as far as like the water aspect of it, I have been drawn to the water since birth. And I don't know why, but I went in the Navy and I was on submarines for five years. I was a quartermaster. So I was the guy that plotted and dotted on charts. And there's no, um, actually, they were just setting up um, digital charts. They call them digital charts, you know, like charts that everybody uses now. But they were just getting them in the Navy in in 99 when I was there. So I helped set up the first digital digital chart um, on the sub. But that's only works on the surface. So you have to go down below. Yeah, GPS doesn't do shit underwater. It doesn't go through the water. So, um, by the way, do you want me to stop cursing? <laughs> no, curse all you want. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a I sailor, man. I got a sailor's mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, fine. Where was I? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm in the Navy now, and um, I'm a quartermaster in the Navy. Everybody's got three jobs on a, on a sub. So I was the quartermaster, the ice seaman, and the nav ET. So basically what that is is uh, the quartermaster plots and dots on charts, preps all the charts, makes sure we don't hit any underwater mountains, keeps us in operating areas. Uh, it's a very important job. It's only one of like five people on board that actually knows our position, um, which was very cool. And it, it made me, I had such a change in my, my personality during that phase of my life. Um, like the first three years of the Navy, the first year I was, I was learning. The second year I was still learning and like the, the third, fourth and fifth years, I was this, this badass quartermaster that was super important. And it just made me feel good about myself, you know, for the first time, you know, I, ha- I had some real, like, look what I've done. Yeah, real thing. responsibility as well. <clears throat> yeah. It was really neat. The last year in the Navy, unfortunately, I was really bored because I wasn't being challenged anymore. And I'm, I'm a person that has to be challenged and I was kind of stuck and I just wanted to get on with my life. So um, they offered me, I think, like 60 grand to reenlist. And I was like, Captain, I'm sorry. He, I, actually, my captain came up to me and he was like, he was like, James, I could really use you on this next um, deployment. And okay. I said, Captain, I, I could really use the money, but I've got some plans. And um, this is leading into the sailings part of it. So I had a buddy there. His name was Rob Mudd. Um, he was my best friend. He was a, a nuke ET. Cool dude. Real smart. Um, he was, me and him were roommates together in Georgia. I was stationed in Georgia and, uh, he was the type of guy that he, like, I had a boat, I had a wakeboarding boat. I love to wakeboard. And, uh, we would go take that thing out like every day and never wash it off because it was like in a brackish river and the mosquitoes would come out as soon as the sunset. So we would go like from the end of work until sunset every day, and then just run into the house, like try to try to clean the boat up, but the trailer just got totally screwed. So I had to buy a new trailer for it. So he took the old trailer and like welded it apart, fixed all the rusty spots, made it into a double sea dew trailer, and then had and then bought two sea dews that were bad, rebuilt the engines in them, and then we had a wakeboarding boat and two sea dews just because this guy was like a, a maniac, you know, kind of mechanic guy. He was also a sailor and also always like tried to get me to go sailing with him. And I was like, man, I don't want to go sailing. I want to go wakeboarding. Like, why would I want to go eight miles an hour? <laughs> and, <laughs> like, like seriously. And, and uh, uh, I never really went with him. And then when I got out of the Navy, he stayed in. And he, the, my, my boat moved from Georgia through the Panama Canal up to Hawaii. And I had never been to Hawaii. And this is the kind of guy Rob was. He flew me to Hawaii and gave me $400 for the, for the time that I was missing work just so I could experience Hawaii with him. Cause I was like, bro, I don't have it. He's like, I'll, I'll let you borrow it, man. I want you to experience this while, while I'm here. Cause I'm only going to be here another year and a half. And 
I, you know, like at the time I was young and stupid and realized like how important that friendship was to me. Anyway, he died sailing around Hawaii. He, he got a slip in uh, Pearl Harbor, which is very difficult to get a slip in. And there's like a 20 year waiting list or something. So he was keeping his boat on the north side of the island. This is Oahu I'm talking about. Um, yeah. And he went around and in Hawaii, if you guys have ever been to Hawaii or sailed in Hawaii, they have, they have these storms called Kona's. A lot of a lot of places have different wind reversal storms that they call different things. In um, Panama, they're called culo de pollo or chicken ass storms. Um, but they're basically the same thing. It's like it's like this really, really small scale hurricane that happens very, very fast. And it's usually like 15 to 30 minutes but it rips. It's like 40, 50 knots of wind, like wind reverses, it rips, whatever fetch you have, it's got six foot waves in the anchorage. And this happens all the time in Hawaii. So he got caught in one of these on his way down. And this is something you really can't forecast. There's, there's ways that you can do it. Like depending on the temperature of the water and the temperature of the air and the way that the wind is flowing, you have to have a lot of local knowledge usually to, to know, yeah. like it's, it's like, you know, an old man that has his bones ache and he's like oh there's some weather coming and then it, it comes it's kind of like that so <laughs> <laughs> like seriously like, yeah yeah this happens yeah culo de pollo is coming right now yeah yeah uh so yeah he got caught in a culo de pollo and um his rudder broke his he got off into his life raft he was they found his body in his wetsuit with um a pelican case tied to him with his phone in it he was firing off flares he was doing everything right but the Coast Guard said they came out to the beach and the, the waves were like seven feet breaking. So there's nothing they can do. They couldn't even get in the water. And that was like yeah. a pretty rough spot of, of Oahu. The like the the south side, there's some spots that are rocky and really nasty. So basically they, they could hear him from the beach, which is really sad. And the wave, you know, came up and he got caught in it and he just couldn't get out of it. He couldn't swim just through couldn't it. Get so. out. Yeah, so he ended up dying, and it was always his dream to go around the world. It wasn't mine. And mm. after he died, I was like, well, you know, what was Rob into? I want to try it out. So I, on a whim, just bought a boat. I went and looked around and found one that I liked. It was an Islander 28. I paid, I think, six grand for it. And I didn't know how to sail at all. Um, after I bought the boat, I didn't know what I was doing. The guy, you know, he could have, he could have been selling me a total turd. Actually, the boat was really nice. I got really lucky. It was a Bob Perry design boat. It sailed like a banshee. It was awesome. Um, side note that boat, the motor, I blew the motor in that boat, like maybe three months after I had it. And I used to sail it in and out of the slip in Marina del Rey, one of the biggest, um, small boat harbors in the world. And it was, it, that's really where I learned to sail. Anyway, so I buy this um, Islander. <laughs> this is a funny story. So I don't know how to sail it. And I, I get online. I get on Craigslist. This is the Craigslist times. This I'm dating myself again. Um, and I, I find this guy that's like, hey, I'm a captain. I, I'm a racer. I, I'll teach you how to sail for $40 an hour or whatever it was, $40 a day. I think it was a day. And okay. so I get, I get on this guy's boat. He's got a Moody 27. That's all slicked out for racing. He had he had like taken all the all the through holes out of it, taken the engine out of it, um, you know, uh, glassed everything over, made the bottom really really smooth, and he was winning all the races. And all the guy did the whole damn time was smoke cigarettes and drink beer. And I I was like, bro, what are you doing? What is that? What is this? And he's like, you just you just fill the sails with wind. Just you know what? You'll learn this on your second lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you dick. Right, what? Okay. <laughs> and. Uh, and his name, the boat name was Blow Me, like just to give you an idea of this guy's personality. An idea of who this guy is, right? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But come to find out, I'm still friends with him. And Bob Gray, if you're watching, you're the man. Um, he was a badass racer. Like he was, he was winning all the races in his class in in Marine Del Rey in in California. He would like you know fly around. He was a, he was a really good sailor. So for him, it wasn't so much like him trying to get me to go to another lesson. It was just so second nature to him that he really didn't know how to teach anything you know <laughs> it's probably um, not the best teacher Good so thing. <laughs> well, but it was great for me because what i thought was well if this asshole can do it i can do it and um it, it just like prodded me to go out and i used to take that boat out like every day i used to go to catalina island every weekend well not every weekend probably like three weekends a month and then i would go night sailing a lot i would go, i would take that boat out like every single time i had a chance i really fell in love with sailing and she was really nimble and easy to easy to sail. And uh, one time I was coming back in and the sea tow guy was following me in. 
and I was tacking and I got really close. He taught me to get really close. I, I sailed with him more after that. He taught me to get really close to boats. Like, you know, when you're tacking up a channel, you want to use the maximum amount of, of space. You don't want to be tacking up yeah. the middle third of the channel. When I mean, right before you hit a boat, you just tack and then freak out the people if they're on the boat. It's pretty fun. Um, and this guy, the Sito guy is following me in and, uh, I get in and I, I, I get into the, uh, slip and dock my boat and he comes up to me and he's like, man, I just got to shake your hand. I've never seen anybody do that. I thought you were in trouble. I was calling out to you. And I'm, I, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's cool of you to say, man. And then I, I thought at that time, like, I'm a badass. I'm such a badass sailor. I can do this. I had no idea. So, I, so I end up, um, I was, a uh, after the Navy, I, I told you I had three jobs in the Navy. I was a um, a quartermaster, an ice seaman, and an AVT. So the, I already told you what the quartermaster does, but the ice seaman was the interior communications guy. So basically, I learned how to solder on board level solder and take resistors out and, and see, see, figure out if a capacitor is bad in a walkie talkie or something. And so I handled all of the sound, sound part phones, the walkie talkies, the, the um, lighting panels, um, and then as far as the Navi T, I handled the sonar, the fathometer, the radar, uh, both the military radar and the Furuno radar because we had two because the military radars just sucked. I mean, I don't know if they still do, but it was horrible. It was like it was like trying to make a, a Volvo from 1935, you know, compete with a, a Ferrari from 2020. It, it was that right. diff <clears throat> it was that bad. And so nobody trusted the military radar. So they made us haul this 120 pound, huge Furuno radar up the sail. And the sail is that like, you know, the part that sticks up on the submarine. Yeah. yeah. So we have to, we have to put this thing around our, our waist and climb that damn thing. And then like mount it on the top. And it's, I, I swear to God, it's like a bunch of monkeys that are just, okay, well, this will work. And you pin it and hopefully it stays and, it was really funny, but that thing worked so much better than the military radar that, you know, we had to, we had to do that every time. So anyway, I learned right. how to work on electronics and I uh, pretty much made my career after the Navy doing that. I got a job in Gloucester, um, Massachusetts. I loved living in Massachusetts. Uh, that only lasted for a couple of years. I got bored doing that. And I was a, I was a travel, basically I was a field tech for people that made like big equipment, like th okay. that play. That place I worked on semiconductors. So I worked on ion implanters. It's one of the um, machines that make computer chips. There's like nine machines, big $7 million machines, lots of systems. Um, very cool how they work. That's a different story though. That, but um, <clears throat> basically it's like a light bulb anyway. Um, and then after that job, I kind of just bounced around. I've never really held a job for that long. I'm, I'm kind of a novel. I have a novelty seeking personality. And I've mm -hmm. always thought that that was a horrible thing. I've been taught in my life that not being able to hold a job is a bad thing. But now, recently, I've been reading a lot more. And like with my personality type, I need to be challenged. I need to have some kind of novelty. I need to have like I'm that kind of personality. So it's not really a bad thing. And it has made me who I am today. So I'm, I get I quit the job from the semiconductor company and I moved to Florida Finally, I'm a beach bum in Florida. It was awesome. Um, uh, I lived right on the canals in Florida with the guy with a couple boats. And we had a pond. Oh, nice. This is the first time, first time in my life I had a pontoon boat. Have you ever had a pontoon boat or been with like on a pontoon boat? Yeah, I've been on them. Yeah, that's really cool. Oh, my God. They're so fun, yeah. man. I, I yeah, would yeah. never have guessed that pontoon boats would be so fun. But it's just basically like a living room that floats. And you can yeah, just yeah. Have, have fun with all your friends and I mean, almost more fun than a sailboat, right? But it just doesn't yeah. go anywhere. And, you know, you have to listen to the motor and stuff. But for Florida, it was great because on the intercoastal, there's really not a lot of waves. So we would yeah, just flat like, as drop. Well, so it's perfect. Yeah, order. it was it was yeah. great. And they have they have they used to have I don't know if they still do all these big parties where like, you know, a thousand boats would go and raft up together. And we would take that thing. And oh, my God, it was it was just amazing. <laughs> That's really quite unique, actually, Florida. turning up. Turning up to a, like a flotilla in a pontoon boat. <laughs> oh, <laughs> dude, funny. it was so fun. We had a bimini on it. It was, it was like seriously, we could fit. We had like eighteen people on that thing more often than not, and it was just a big yeah. party. It was great. Mm. Definitely recommend the the float the flotilla 
pontoon boat action. Yeah, I've uh, seen a couple of videos of those things getting, um, you know, getting into some choppy water. Uh, that's the only yeah. issue with them. One one wave goes straight over the top, and then the entire thing just sinks. Actually, in um, in Gibraltar near where we are, there is like a company that have basically taken, you know, it's like aluminium tubes. I mean, I don't know what yeah. I don't know what they're actually made, but it's aluminium. Basically, tubes. So yeah. So they put like one bedroom apartments on them. And then there's just like slips inside the marina near Gibraltar where they're just renting those out like on Airbnb. But they're really cool. They've got like a roof terrace on the top. You get an electric bike with every single one. They're fantastic. Oh, I absolutely am going to rent one of those. I'm glad that uh, you told me about that. I'm actually on my way to Gibraltar in about two months, three months. Oh, no my buddy's, My buddy's given me his, um, he bought a brand new Bavaria 57C. Uh, in 2018 and he cruised it nice. for the last th three or four years and now he wants it back in the um ibiza to sell it so he's like bro if you take my boat from annapolis to ibiza you can have it for as long as you want go wherever you want i'll pay for it just deliver it there and i'll party with you in ibiza and then send you home i was like i can't say no to that you know and so i'm um, gonna do we, like we need to ahead. hook up for this i'm like one oh, yeah. hour away from gibraltar and ibiza is my cruising ground well, I'm looking for a crew for the whole ride, man. So if you want to go, we're, we're doing um, uh, Annapolis, uh, Bermuda. I got a really good friend, a couple of good friends in Bermuda. And then Azores, uh, uh, Gibraltar, and then Ibiza. So if you want to join me for any or all of those legs, I would love to host, bro. Man, maybe Azores to Ibiza? That would sound like a good one. God, sweet. I'll tell him to hold you to that. <laughs> Hey, I'll hold you to that. <laughs> Don't worry about that. I'm up for that. <laughs> sweet, sweet. Awesome. awesome. Well, you're, that, that'll be a fun one. It's a, it's a comfy boat. It's a cool boat. You'll like it. Yeah. Um, okay, so where am I at now? I'm in, I'm in Florida. Um, I'm just, I still haven't gotten a boat yet. This is like two years after I got in the Navy, and I'm getting bored. Um, I get a job in California. So, okay. oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I, I met a girl french girl and we moved to paris for a little while like <laughs> like like i moved to paris for like 11 months and that's a long time right, okay actually to be completely honest here's the real story um the, the the girl and i um the girl was a little nuts but she was beautiful i'm still very good friends with her i ended up marrying her um we moved to paris and she was suicidal and she jumped out of the four-story window so I wake up one night and I was, we were drinking and I was, you know, passed out drunk. I wake up and there's 10 cops in my house. They arrest me. There's blood all over the outside and they won't tell me where my wife is, where my girlfriend is. And I go to jail that night for attempted murder in Paris. And uh, the only way I got out of it was two days later, they found a suicide note that she had wrote to her mom and her mom like got me out of it. Um, so the, I had to go through well, that. And, and, and well, after, you were married after, to her at that point. No, I married her after that. Right. Um, so it, like I had a decision to make. My mom was like, look, I'll send you a ticket and you, and I, and you can go, come home and, you, you know, get over this. And this girl's unstable. You should probably. But I, I felt like I really loved her, man. I, and I felt like leaving her was like the worst option I could do. It's like if I was in that state, I would in that want... situation. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I stayed and I got a job there. Um, I ended up starting my own company, Remodeling Houses. Uh, do, doing what you're doing now actually yeah. so maybe i'll maybe in reciprocity you know you come coop for me and i'll come remodel your house for a week so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good deal i get to save yeah. a shitload and you can build my house yeah that's a good deal yeah yeah okay <laughs> yeah so i i really thrived in paris i really loved it there um and then i wanted to be a rock star because i like i told you before i'm a, I'm a rocker Okay, so we, we, we moved to LA so I can be a rock star, which it was, it was really a fun time in my life. I was in a lot of bands. I, was, I told you I was in that band with Claude Schnell. I learned so much about music. I went to music school, which was one of my dreams. Uh, so I, I really don't regret any part of that. Um, but, I, you know, I had delusions of grandeur and I really, I mean, at least I tried. It, you know, you, you never yeah, regret you gave it a shot. You, you try. Yeah. So, and I really liked LA. Um, I didn't, there was a few things I didn't like about it. Like some of the people I'm, I'm not a person that like uses other people to you know, gain notoriety, but that's kind of like the feeling I had from a that's lot of LA people in well. LA. Yeah. It's really hard to meet like genuine people, but I did. And I, I still have some friends from there. And that's where I started living on boats. I ended up marrying that girl. 
And then we got divorced after a couple of years. And then I bought a boat and I was living with another girl and um, we broke up and I didn't have a, a place. I had moved in with her. And so I was like, well, I'll just stay on the boat for a little while until I figure out what I'm going to do. And I realized, like, I don't know why this never crossed my mind before, but <laughs> boats, boats are always in primo real estate. I mean, like I was in Venice, California, like right next to is, is uh, uh, Marina Del Rey. But if you if yeah. you understand anything about Hollywood and Venice, Venice is like I think we were paying eighteen hundred dollars for a one bedroom. And then my boat was like a half a mile away on the water. And I was paying four hundred dollars a month. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm not moving. This is great. <laughs> And I can take my apartment to Catalina. Yeah. Um, which I'm sure a lot of people have had this like eureka moment with boating, you know, like, whoa, this, this is the way to go. <laughs> the problem right. is um, in, in Marina del Rey, you, and actually most of Southern California, it's very oh, hard to get a liverboard slip. Yeah. They, exactly. It's very yeah. difficult to get a liverboard slip. And actually those, those pontoon boats that you're talking about, there's like, a handful of these houseboats left that are grandfathered in, but no houseboats are allowed anymore. They're actually tearing, tearing down the old marinas and making like these huge marinas with big, huge boat docks. And they're trying to push out the little boats. So they're yeah. making it very, very difficult for people to do that anymore. Unfor unfortunately, but at this time there was all these shitty marinas. It was really fun. I got kicked out of like every single one because I had a dog. I had a Rottweiler <laughs> at the time. So it was right. me and my 130 pound <laughs> Rottweiler. Rottweiler. Yeah. And uh, he was super nice, but he was like, you know, territorial. So I had to, I had to hide him and I would take him to work. And uh, I was working kind of a bunch of different jobs. I, I ended up getting a job there before I got there uh, working for a microdermabrasion manufacturing company. And I got fired after two days. <laughs> so what I, did you do? I, like, <laughs> I was I was the guy that fixed all the stuff for the factory. Like, but and, what did and you do? You got fired. Oh, oh, well, they didn't label one of the outlets as 220. And I plugged in this really expensive um, soldering iron and it blew up. And they were super pissed. And I'm like, guys, you got to label the fucking outlets. Like, how am I supposed to know that? Oh, whatever. And then like, as soon as I spoke oh, up right, and told okay. them, like I should have just like bowed my head and tucked my tail between my legs, but I'm not that guy. So yeah, I kind of screwed myself and I didn't yell. I, I was just like, guys, like, this is not my fault. Like, obviously this needs to be labeled. Whoever did this is an idiot, but mm -hmm. yeah, you can't call the management an idiot on your second day. <laughs> <laughs> did they not yeah. give you in the, in the debrief in the intro? They didn't really no, 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 there was the no, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was no intro. It was just like, it was just like, here go you go. Work. Our guy yeah. quit and this is it. And it was like this pile of crazy shit. Uh, yeah, that was an, that was an interesting. So so then I was like, what am I going to do for money? I'm, 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 I had need to support my wife. She can't work here because she's French. I have to like figure out something. Right. So I started doing background acting. I started specking for jobs. I had like five jobs. I was just going around, you know, like busting my butt, trying to do whatever I could. It was fun. I actually had a yeah. really good time at that time. Didn't have any money, but I was surrounded by all these actors and, and people that were driven and, want, you know, singers. And I was like, well, do I want to be an actor? Do I want to be a rock star? Do I like at that time, the whole world was my oyster and it was really fun. And I How was old you at this point when you were there. Like, what age were you then? I was trying to think about that while I was telling this story. Uh, I think I was like 26. I think I'm 26 at this point. Right. Uh, Just like 26, 27, to, 28. To yeah. 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 And I'm like, I'm single most of the time. I mean, I'm dating, but um, single with my puppy on my boat. And I had a few different boats. Uh, this, this oyster is number five. Um, and it was just such a fun time because I, I like, I had all, all these friends with boats and we would take all of our boats together to, to um, Catalina and Catalina has they actually have the Catalina wine mixer now just because of that movie Step Brothers. Have you ever seen that movie? So that wasn't real before, but they made it real. Because of no, that movie. no, no, that was a completely made up thing. And then they started doing and it. And then they made it real. It's just a Catalina wine mixer, man. <laughs> yeah. Man, Will Farrell is just changing the world in so many ways. Oh, like, what a, what a hero he is. What a hero. <laughs> yeah, he's a hero. Uh, but they did have this, this um, pirate festival there every year. 
uh, actually two <laughs> they, they started they started with one right. and then they and then they wanted to do two like so to juxtapose the, like the, to the one in the winter and one in the summer and the even in the winter in southern california it's not that bad the water's always cold it's kind of always the same temperature it comes off yeah. the the currents coming down from alaska so it's you know, like the water gets progressively warmer but it doesn't really get warm until you get into like baja um yeah which also was an awesome thing. That's where I got into spearfishing while I lived there. I would drive down to Baja and drive to Cabo and, and like spearfish all the way down in Baja. It's badass. I, I loved doing that. Every year I would take a solo trip down with my puppy. Um, anyway, so I'm living on the boat. I'm about 26, 27, 28 now. Uh, I started working for this company that was paying me really well. Uh, I, it was a company out of um, Kansas and really good company to work for. And uh, I started saving my money. It was, it was um, water jet equipment. So like big, they cut like granite and steel and actually they can cut through oh, steel yeah. like this thick with, wa with water. Yeah. Um, you're familiar with that technology. Yeah, yeah. I was working on the, on the high pressure pumps. So I was working for the company that made the high pressure pumps and I had, they basically gave me Cal um, Canada, United States and Mexico. And I spoke at this time, I spoke passable Spanish. So they gave me Mexico too. So I would just like drive around and fly around and fix these things. So it's a great job for me because it was, it was always a changing locale. It was always a changing problem. It was always challenging. And I was the hero. Like everywhere I went, <laughs> I was the guy that like, yeah, your shit's fucked up. And yeah. I, I would, I would fly in and it's, this is costing these people like $300 an hour and it's a couple of days. And I would, I would fly in and fix it. And they'd be like, Oh, thank you, James. Can we take you out to lunch? Can we do this? It was, it was so, <laughs> so cool. I started working um, like on, on the side for people that would be like, James, I would just like you to come in like every month and just, you know, check over my thing. I'll give you a thousand dollars done. Sure. No problem. And so I would, I, I would work weekends. I would work, you know, I, I, I was like, I've never been one to really budget, but I, I was very conscious about how much money I was spending and I wasn't spending a lot on rent because I had the boat. So I was just pocketing all the money. And, and after about four years, I had about 135 grand, I think. Oh, and then oh. I was just, I was so sick of this job that because by this point I had mastered that technology and I was, it just wasn't challenging for me anymore. Plus the politics for working for corporate is just, uh, you know, you know how that goes. Yeah. I ended up moving to Maui. I got my, I got my, um, captain's license first because i had all that sea time from the navy and it counted yeah. for my captain's license so i got a hundred ton license um with a sail endorsement and a towing endorsement just because you know it's easy you just basically just pay for that and then I, I i realized later that i was so happy and so proud like yeah i'm a real captain but like people bullshit through that. Like anybody can give you a captain. I mean, you don't even have to have any seats on. You can just get somebody else to sign off for it. It's really funny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the RYA version, though, they're real captains. Like if you have an RYA license, you know what the hell you're doing. Yeah, uh, you need to prove the miles as well. I've recorded all mine, like on camera. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. good. That's good. Yeah. The, the the U.S. Coast Guard, it's a little bit easier. It, they may have changed it, but um, I had the miles. I mean. But some of them, the reason that I got a hundred ton was because I was on the submarine. Yeah, with the RYA, I think to do the Yacht Master, it's 2,600 nautical miles, but I think 600 of them have to be offshore or something. I don't know. Anyway, you have to put the, you, have, you do have to put the miles in, like you do have to have the experience of life, you know, you can't even qualify to get on the course. 2600 is a lot of miles it would take a, a lot of trips to catalina for that let's see 70 miles round trip <laughs> you do the math yeah you're going to be doing it for a while yeah well that, that i crossed the atlantic this year and that's the reason why i did it because i think i had I, you know if i calculated them all together i probably had a few thousands but i was like there's no way i'm even bothering with that so yeah atlantic crossing you get like two and a half in straight away so easy just tick it off and it's perfect done, done. yeah cool yeah. did you do that on your own boat or on someone else's no, no, with a couple of friends who uh, I've been sailing with them quite a while. Whenever they do any offshore stuff and they need a hand, they just give me a shout and I uh, go down there and help them out. And uh, yeah, they're now, well, they're in Martinique now. Yes, yeah, so they're uh, chilling out in Martinique or somewhere around there. Might be St. Martin or something, I don't know. But uh, yes, yeah, so that was like a little uh, Beneteau 361 clipper. So cool. um, yeah, it's quite quite a light boat for crossing the, <laughs> crossing the Atlantic. I think it's like five tons. So yeah, not much sleep. 
Um, but uh, good experience anyway. You need to pay attention. You know what I mean? It's not like a big 60 foot where you can set your sails and you've got your alarms and then you can go and chill out. Like You have to actually pay attention. You have to sail the boat. So, yeah, it's good. I love being offshore, man. I've I've totally oh, fallen so in nice. love with with being to making passages. Some people like it, some yeah. people don't. If you if you you have a propensity to get seasick, you usually don't really like it. But I don't, and um, I've I've only been sick a few times. I, it's so nice yeah. to be able to un, unplug. And man, when when I first started cruising, I actually got rid of my cell phone for like a good six months eight months i think i didn't even have a phone because i had a kitty well let me finish the story so i, I had 130 grand now uh, i had my captain's license i also got my patty instructor license so i was thinking i could i could work as a um, scuba instructor and uh, diver or whatever i could run a dive boat or something so i i got in touch with a guy in maui and i was like look i got these credentials i got this experience i'd like to um work for you and he's like yeah you're cool sweet come over and so I got that job before I even got to Maui, I quit my job. And then I was looking for a cruising boat to buy with this money I had. I didn't really need the money. I just wanted something to do. So I wasn't burning through all the money I've been saving up. So, which was an awesome decision. Um, working and, and living in Maui was so different than uh, working in Southern California and living in Southern California. Such cool people. I mean, I still have an 808 number. I still do the Shaka. I still, and I wasn't even there that long. It just had such a powerful effect on me that I I think that's the best state in the in the whole United States. If I ever go back, that's where I'm living. Oh, nice. Um, so I ran a dive boat there for like four or five months, and then I found my cruising boat, Zingaro, the catamaran, uh, which yep. was a 1984 Crowther Cat designed in 1979 by Locke Crowther. Locke Crowther was a very prolific designer with over 2,000 boats to his name. And uh, most notably for your listeners, probably, is the designer of the first Katana catamarans. So my boat oh, wow. was like, okay. like, like version 0.1 of Katana. There was a, a few after that. And, <laughs> right. and then, he, like, he, he, yeah, he realized, like, every time he made another, another catamaran design, he would, he would, like, now they changed the design a little bit to say, okay, it's more comfortable if we don't put so much camber in it. And then like we, if we can't out the hulls, it's got a little bit more stability when it, when it heals over all that stuff, he was learning as he went. So mine was right. one of the learning boats, which is really cool. If you really get down into the design of it, cause I've super nerded out into that now because I had the boat end up, end up ripping in half. So it, like it was a design flaw and it was a building flaw that ended up doing that. And I, I wanted to really understand like how that, all work together so uh i get i fly to florida um one way and i'm i, li I like this boat i actually was going to look at two boats one was uh zingaro the one that i bought and the other one was adrenaline the one that my buddy billy bought on tula's endless summer if you guys have ever seen that channel i was okay. slated to look to look at his boat the, the second one but i just fell in love with this one i bought it on the spot it was the first boat I really looked at and I didn't have to think about it very long. It was basically like, he's like, well, do you want the boat or not? And it was in such good shape. I was like, yeah, sure. And then I wrote him a check for $65,000, which is the most money of I, at that point I had ever spent on anything. And I was like sweating bullets. And we were talking about maybe like changing it into gold coins. And like, you know, that's how I could start the YouTube channel. Like, <laughs> and then over the doubloons. <laughs> like, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Like total pirate yeah. style. <laughs> But they yeah. wouldn't do it. They wouldn't even give me the cash. I was like, can I just have the cash and give them cash? And they're like, no, we, we have to like request that much cash. And then so it was a, the banks aren't very, very, you know, you, they don't have senses of humor in there, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think they gave me like like 20 grand or something. They're like, we can give you 20 grand for five minutes, but then you need to give it back. <laughs> so, such a nuts, man. You can go to your bank and you're like, can I please have my money? And they're like, no, yeah. but if you write a piece of paper, we'll give your pretend money to somebody else in their pretend. Exactly. Money. exactly. It doesn't yeah. even exist. Yeah. <laughs> <That's nuts. laughs> yeah. No, no, no. You crazy. want real money? Oh, no, no, no. We don't have that. Yeah. Don't know what that is. It's right. pretty funny. Okay. So I buy this boat and I end up moving in this guy's backyard um mark if you're heck i call him pod right now because he's like my second father um he gave me he was such a cool dude he was a cruiser and and a very successful uh, merchant marine and just a smart dude like everything he did he he was an engineer like just every single thing was like okay what if we do it this way it's better this way it'll be stronger this way sweet dude to learn to learn from so that's that was my introduction to 
cruising, which, which was this like great mentor. And after I, I took that boat to Easter Island and I called him from Easter Island and I'm like, Padre, nice. I'm in freaking Easter Island with your boat, man. He's like, bro, I am so proud of you. It was a really good feeling. Um, so I, I'm working on this boat and I have no idea what I'm doing. So when I first saw it, it was, it, it's, it was like 20 feet wide and I had never been on a boat that big. And I was like, oh my God, this thing is huge. Uh, but I, I learned how to work it and it had kick up rudders. It was a really crazy boat. It was built for speed. So it had, uh, fiberglass rudder tubes. It had, um, uh, dagger boards. The bottom was completely slick. Uh, it had two inboard 10 horsepower Yanmar engines, like, you know, generator engines, um, shaft driven, which is very rare for cats. Um, it had, it had bow bulbs on the front because they had actually designed it to be too thin. And then it was like wave cutting bows. One of the first cats that ever had wave cutting bows, but they made them too thin. So the, the, um, front had a, had a propensity to like bury itself in the trough. So they made bow bulbs and that those were added later. Uh, it was just such a cool boat. It was plywood on top with just one really thin layer of fiberglass. And it had all these holes in it everywhere. Like, like it looked like somebody had gone and like just routed out all these pieces of the plywood to make it lighter. And that's exactly what they did. This boat was built to be like a, a guy's toy. And I was trying to take it around the world. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's what I could afford at the time. So yeah, remember could, I said, could you make that thing go? Oh man, I got 22 knots out of that, that beast. Yeah. It was a 38. Oh, cat. It. oh yeah. 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 Anytime, anytime yeah. you have a top speed with sailing, I, I'm pretty sure that's always surfing. Yeah. Surfing something. Yeah. What was the yeah. cruising speed on it? About we would, I, you know, I sailed it pretty conservatively. So if it, if it went up to 13, I stopped it. I, I, I always like slowed it down. So <laughs> that's quite I, quick. Yeah. So I would often go like 11, 12 knots, but um if it got up to 13 it got a little scary especially at night and then if it was really blowing it would always do 16 knots i mean if i was running with with a storm it was going 16 and then the the one time it was 22 is just like you know it's like a, a, a 60 foot boat with the theoretical hull speed of 8.9 is doing 17 knots surfing down a wave is the same same theory it was really fast boat but the problem was it wasn't built for what i was doing i was taking big waves and i was like riding i remember coming from bocas bocas del toro panama to uh, puerto lindo panama to get to go through the canal my my um there's a lot of torsional flex on those boats so the yeah. main beam and the rear beam take a lot of force and the main the main beam snapped on the front and it opened up the hull and i was like i could see the moon <laughs> coming through and i was like holy shit I'm like what am i gonna do i'm way offshore it's I'm doing 13 knots. It's huge waves. Uh, I'm going to take a Sharpie marker and I'm going to just mark the crack. And if it gets any bigger, I'll just keep going down. I didn't sleep at all that night. Uh, I just went down there like every five minutes to look at this crack. And I'm like, is it getting bigger? Is it getting bigger? And it, it, it didn't actually, the boat held together well. And then I, it was a, it was a real pain in the ass to fix it. But um, I ended up having to scarf in another piece of wood. Anyway, the, the boat was built out of wood and, plywood and it wasn't even like real good wood it was like two by fours you know like not you know hardwood or anything so uh let's see i lost I, I broke the main beam in panama um well, i ran out of money in panama i i had i'd started the youtube channel but i remember i told you i had 135 grand so i paid 65 for the boat and then i, I put like another 15 or 20 into it and so i still had like 30 or 40 grand that I just completely blew through when I met my ex-girlfriend. I met her in, I, I, did, I did solo for about four months. And then I met Kim in um, uh, Mexico. And then we just spent like, I think five or six months just having fun and, and blowing through all my money. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was We've great. It. it was fine. Yeah, yeah. It was one of the best yeah. times. You know, it's really weird to have that juxtaposition of like, I have to save everything for four years and like every single penny counts. And then I don't care. I just want to go have fun and whatever. And money doesn't matter. <laughs> and then yeah. when you're down to your last 10 grand, you're like, oh shit, how the hell am I going to pay for new sales? I mean, I was, I was sailing around with this huge, like nine foot rip in my jib. It was so funny, man. I looked like such a bum. Um, also one of the best times of my life. And the, the YouTube channel started making money right about the time that we were running out. 
So I used my, I had 10 grand left. I remember this. Oh no, I had 15 grand left. I put five grand in Bitcoin. Like I timed it perfectly for the top. And then it fell like 50%. So I lost like, <laughs> like three grand in a week. And I'm like, oh my God. And, and uh, my girlfriend convinced me to get out of Bitcoin because she was like, you're going to go gray, dude. Just get out. We'll, we'll yeah. figure out how to make money out of a different way, uh, which was super funny. And then uh, looking back on it anyway. And then I, so I had like 11 or 12 grand left and new sales were seven grand. And I was like, shit. Okay. Whoa, that's a lot. I'm not. Yeah. But it was a, it, I need, I wanted a spinnaker too. So that's a spinnaker of okay. jib and a main. Um, oh, fair enough. I, that's I, all right. I, I, yeah, yeah. Not, not too bad. So I was like, look, that's how we're going to go. So if we don't have sales, we're not going to go anywhere. And we're going to be stuck in freaking Panama. I don't want to be stuck here. So I'm just going to spend the last, you know, we'll have five grand left to figure out what we're going to do. I mean, I can, I can always like try to borrow money from somebody, I guess. Um, so I spent it on the sales, which was a really good decision because that, last five grand i we were able to stretch that out for about six months to to let the youtube channel kind of build and we just all we did was we sat in in panama for eight months and worked on the youtube channel and it ended up going up really fast it was like five months of solid work 40 hours a week each of us and we were starting to make you know a thousand bucks a month so we could actually leave still didn't so have is this money. like you you're making a video every week and you're putting loads of time in editing it that type of stuff yeah. And learning how to do it and buying the equipment to do it. And like, we had no idea what we were doing. So it was a good learning experience. I think we had a drone. I had bought a, oh yeah, I had bought a good camera and a drone. And like, I knew that I was going to start this thing because I started the YouTube channel when I left the dock, when I bought the, when I first bought the boat. So like my first two videos are me at the dock, putting on the, you know, like making a hard top for the boat and getting it ready to go. And then uh, a tour of it. And yeah. Um, I actually watched that video when it first came out because I was thinking you? about, well, yeah, I did like way back. Um, oh, yeah, I watched cool. that. I was like, and because you did it in quite a creative way as well. I remember you did something with the uh, tubes, like you had them bending or something. I can't remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I took PVC tubing like you would use yes, in the underground yeah, for, yeah. for, for, like a for water. And I yeah. heated it up with a heat gun and then just bent it and then just kind of like cut it off and then and then yeah. glued it to PVC a lumber that I had chopped into blocks. And that was like my makeshift tubing. And then I took that tubing to the guy and I was like, make me that. And he made yep. it out of aluminum and it, it was, it was great. I, and I had that actually had the, had the added benefit, uh, which I've realized now with boating, if you put any kind of structure on your boat, it's a handhold. So I did that with the oyster too. I put a big frame with 1600 Watts of solar and it's great. I have handholds everywhere for people. And we, like when I went sailing the first time with a, some friends with that hard top that I had made, I looked around and every single person was grabbing one of those bars. And I was like, yeah, this is great. For something else as well. Didn't yeah, even really freaking realize like integrating handholds. That's actually how you know a good boat manufacturer because they integrate handholds everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's good for yep. like if you just in your bimini or your spray hood as well. Like when we get our next boat, I've decided like every everywhere possible, like on the sides, on the roof, we're just going to get like little handholds welded on out of stainless tubing because they're so handy and necessary Perfect. as well. Especially outside. Outside, having things yeah. to grab onto outside is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, we've, we've seen a couple where you got like this on the side of the spray hoods. There is um, like right on the side, they've just got a bracket like yeah just like some stainless steel tubing welded on so as you walk around your spray hood you've got something to grab onto on the spray hood rather than just like trying to grab onto the top of it which is yeah exactly. I mean, that's great because that's that's the dangerous part like you've got your rigging you've probably got some handholds down on the like uh on the you know uh saloon roof coach roof whatever you call it so yeah coming around that corner that's like the dangerous part so yeah it's really useful to have them there the best manufacturers of Dodgers put a, a rail on the outside of the entire Dodger on the front, like the, the leading yeah. or the tra trailing oh, edge, the I front guess you could part. say. Oh, yeah, yeah the trailing on, edge. On yeah, the, okay. On the trail uh, inside the cockpit. And then yeah. on the bi the bimini as well. If you can if you can mount a rail that goes all the way along the bimini and have two big rails there, those are, that's I mean, it costs a lot yeah, of money to do that, to integrate that in. But if you're gonna do that, I would absolutely recommend and you can do it. Um, creatively you don't have to have a stainless steel rail going around the bimini the way that i did it was i just used nitacore and then I, I used pvc lumber and then cut out a channel 
and then stuck the night accord the lumber over the over the um channel and then that was my handhold i just routed off the yeah, good idea. hard hard edges and it was yeah. super easy and it lasted forever i don't think i ever even repainted that thing it was great i loved that hard top i was super proud of it mm-hmm. I'm like yeah i built that yeah so, <laughs> so now we're in panama right and um we're broke and we're just now starting to make money, but we still don't have enough money to go through the Panama Canal. So we borrow two grand from uh, my girlfriend's sister and we go through the Panama Canal, which we actually re- repaid. We, we repaid that years later. Um, and so we're through the canal. Oh, before we go through the canal, I met these girls that were running a charter, basically pirate boat called One World um, in Boca del Toro. And they, were, they had a guy down um, just as a friend and his name was Lewis. He he had a um, a big expedition boat up in Alaska, and he was like, "Hey man, go to Isla del Coco. When you get through the canal, you need to see it." You know, like a lot of people, they they try to get across as soon as they get through, but that side of the world, you know, you got to go and see it. You got to go upwind a little bit to get to it. But basically, you got to go from the Panama Canal through it into the Pacific up north to Costa Rica. Check in there. Uh, go into the take a bus for nine hours get permission to go to the island spend i think it costs like 150 bucks a day and then you can take the four-day trip out to isla del coco but the story behind isla del coco was insane i mean the treasure of lima was supposed to be there and uh it was like the last pirate controlled island and it's like a shark sanctuary there's every kind of shark you could ever want to see tigers and galapagos and hammerheads and i swam with all of them there beautiful place i mean the only and the only way to get there is either dive charter which is like i don't know six or seven hundred bucks a day or Mm -hmm. private sailboat um it's notoriously difficult passage but we got really lucky and we we got like one tack the whole way and so from there it was a really easy tack to get to ecuador we wanted to see ecuador maybe go to the galapagos so we went we didn't have the money to go to galapagos we went to ecuador uh refit the boat there we didn't have any money to go to, to the Galapagos still because we had just um, refit the boat and put a water maker on it. And then we went to Easter Island. Um, and I, I swear, man, this was like three years ago. We got blessed with the most impressive weather window that I, I, we couldn't have asked for better weather. So we went one tack, 18 days, all the way down to Easter Island. And it was such a beautiful oh, wow. sail. One of the best sails of my life. We didn't catch hardly any fish. It's kind of a dead zone there, but we also didn't have any big problems. We almost hit a guy though, uh, 500 miles out to sea with a one engine Ponga without a Bimini fishing for tuna out of Manta, Ecuador. And we, we stopped and we were like, what are you doing? And he's like, miles oh, we're out. 500 miles. What the hell? Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> insane. We almost hit him. Yeah. And, and so we stopped and we talked to him. And we're like, what are you doing out here? And, and they're like, there's all these huge Persaner boats. Persaner boats are the ones with like a helicopter on the front and a, and a boat on the back. And what they do is the helicopter goes and like corrals the fish. And then the big boat drives next to the fish and the little boat goes off the back and puts the net out. And they just get like the whole oh, okay. school of fish, which is yeah. horrible. But um, I, I absolutely do not agree with that practice. I think that that, that should be illegal. But yeah, um, so, there's just no way of policing the water. It's it sucks that so so many people are raping the water. Well, you can anyway, you can police the marinas, and you could yeah, and you could make equipment. it. It can be done. Yes, exactly. And Fishing I'm all for is that. Too powerful. Well, we need to get together, man. I mean, there's there's got to be some kind of grassroots movement we can do to like bomb these boats or something. Um, uh, there was a documentary on it. Like, was I think it was that Sea Spiracy? Was it that? Was it the Sea Spiracy documentary where they were talking about it? I didn't see that one, but I'm sure they uh, probably. Oh, actually, man. It. Yeah, like, listen. If you don't like watching sea life on net, just die for absolutely no reason, which I can't imagine anybody does. Uh, I'd advise not watching that because it'll probably confirm a bunch of what you already know, but it'll just make you hate the world. Um, so, it's up to you. If you watch it, I could just, yeah, I talks, can just talks look a lot about that practice of fishing. You can just look on the AIS maps of the world and see how many Chinese fishing ships are out there. And that's that'll, that alone will make your heart sink. Yeah, mate, we're even rape, off the coast of the UK, the water. like everywhere. We're, yeah, we're raping it's, the water. Um, yeah, so you know, the, another side, uh, side effect of that is, I mean, as, as well as them just catching like turtles and dolphins and then, you know, them just dying for no reason, whatever they catch in the nets. 
like even in Spain, like we, we've been in marinas in Spain and we've seen fishing boats pull in and just like throw dolph- dead dolphins and turtles overboard as they're entering marinas. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and you'd hurts. think like Europe has got, you know, some type of protection for sea life and now. Or how I mean, about, do, how about, but none of them care. How about these assholes? I mean, I'm, I'm going to leave this one in. If you do this, you're an asshole that cut the fins off sharks and just throw them in back in the water alive, like to, to, to basically drown yeah, or suffocate. Yeah, really. stupid. That is, yeah. what? It's the same. It's the who's same the as... guy that decided that was okay? Well, it's for soup, isn't it? That's they, they, yeah. they do it because it's like a, a delicacy of soup. But uh, mate, it's the same as taking uh, the tusks off elephants. Like you've got uh, like criminal networks in Africa and stuff. They just kill like these ginormous al- animals just for a tusk to sell on a black market for like, I mean, I don't know who's even buying. Like, who who sits at home, looks at the TV, and goes, "You know, it would look great there on the wall, a tusk." But like, who's that person? Do you know, <laughs> it's just like it's just weird. I'm glad that they've made that uh, that illegal. They've made it a real yeah, yeah. finally. Um, yeah. yeah, but but it's you just know what? the same as that in a way. The the world needs a giant awakening, which I think may happen in our lifetime, where we elevate our culture to you know respect life and respect sentient beings. But that's another conversation. Yeah, that's um, a bigger conversation. How we yeah. get to those solutions. Yeah. <laughs> but but if anybody listening is part of a movement where you know you're trying to stop these person or boats, I would absolutely want you to contact me, please. I would love to use my influence to to help with that. Anyway, so where are we now? Oh, we're in Isla del Coco. So Isla del Coco is amazing, a uh, beautiful place. The there, it's run by some. Um, I think I think like four or five rangers that live there. Cool place. If you ever if you're ever in the Pacific and you're going through the canal, go up north and see that. It's worth the trip, and the trip is cool too. There's a lot of really 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 neat spots that everybody misses. Um, so we went down to Ecuador. Ecuador is another an amazing place. Cheap, cool, nice people. Um, they had just gotten rocked by a hurricane, so we raised some money for the town there. Uh. I, and really corrupt though i mean very interesting place not dangerous just corrupt and the streets are shit and they're like the people are like cool. corrupt at the top but general yeah 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 like, yeah like they while we were there they redid the streets like four fucking times and they never got the streets correct and they just kept doing it to just because whoever was deciding to redo the streets probably had friends and was pocketing most of the money that was supposed to go into rebuilding the city because it was yeah, demolished. Yeah. I think it was like an 8.2 on the Richter scale. And it, it it like leveled the city, man. There was huge cracks. It was, it was nuts. Um, so, but I absolutely recommend Ecuador. Ecuador is an amazing place. Uh, we didn't, unfortunately, get to go to Galapagos, but we went to Easter Island. And then from Easter Island, we got to go to every island in Pitcairn. There's four. Ducey, Pitcairn, um, Henderson, and Ueno. Not in that order. These two are, are switched. Ducey, Henderson, Pitcairn, Orwayno. Uh, then we spent like a week at, at every one of them. And it was just, oh, the water there is just insane. If you guys are thinking What time of about, year was it when you went? Because you said you got like a perfect weather window. What time of year was that? It was It was this time. It was May. January, right, okay. March, all April, right. May. We went, we left um, Ecuador in May. And it, this is all documented. So you can find out exactly what day. But this is the time to go. And I think mm-hmm. they're just now opening up. So I think people are just now starting to go back there. So maybe okay. maybe one of these U- U- adventurous YouTube channels will go there. I really want to go there again, but I'm not going that direction. So uh, we got to go to every island on, on Pitcairn. And Pitcairn has, they've, they've documented as like being the best water in the world. The, they found the deepest coral there at like about 130 feet, which is about 40 meters, which is amazing that coral can live because it needs light to live. And yeah. most of the light light is absorbed by the water down there. It has to be ultra clear for coral to be that to grow that deep. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we met some of the scientists that lived on Henderson because nobody lives on Henderson. There's not a water source there, but it's a such a wild, crazy island. And documented some of the plastic pollution that this r- really remote island has. I mean, it's just covered in plastic, and no one lives there. No one has ever lived there, and it's just that's a really good testament about how dirty human beings are and what we're doing to the planet 
Yeah, that reminds me, actually. I, I, I read an article on it. Um, I think it was only about a week ago or a couple of weeks ago, but it was showing you photos of some of the, uh, I don't know if it was beaches or like rocky beaches, I'm not sure, but it was showing you photos of the amount of plastic that was actually on there. And it was like, there's, there's nobody here. It's in the middle of nowhere and it's literally covered in plastic. And it's like, that's shit. Because you know it's just come from some city somewhere or, you know, someone's just dumping it in thousands of miles away and it's all ended up on this, you know, tiny place. Yeah, it was like pretty soul destroying reading it yeah well it's right in the south pacific gyre so everybody's heard of the north pacific garbage patch uh, which they mm-hmm. call garbage island but it's not really an island it's just a, a place where the gyre area. in this in the center of a gyre that is covered in, in trash because that's kind of how the yeah. currents work this one just happens to have an island there so the island gets you know trash and flip-flops and a lot of buoys a lot of a lot of fishing buoys and fishing nets yeah. and we tried to clean up. I mean, we took what we could, but we, you know, you can't really hardly make a dent in that. Yeah, they were saying like uh, just under eighty percent of the trash that they were picking up on those islands was fishing equipment. It was most mostly nets. Um, Absolutely, yeah, nets, line, that type of stuff. That's what I've seen in my travels. Is eighty percent of what? If I see it on coral, I'll I'll take some time and I'll get it off because I don't want to. I don't yeah. want to kill the coral. Um. But some of these fishing lines are this big around and they're probably propylene and they're yeah. super hard. And then what's really crazy is in, in that island, since it's been happening for so long, the coral has started growing around the stuff. So some of the stuff yeah. is like you'll see this bright orange, thick walled plastic buoy. And then the coral is like grown around it. And it was wicked, man. It was it was kind of sad. Not even kind of sad. It was mm-hmm. super sad. We, we were super upset about it. We made a very good um, episode that week about that documenting yeah. that do you know uh, anyway. this one um oh yeah go on carry on i've got a habit of no 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 of course. Yeah, go no on. go ahead you can ask a question yeah, no Your there's um, there's, a, there's a documentary on you know i'm not sure what channel it's on because i've only watched it on youtube but it's like uh af- after humans or something it's so it, it shows you like if humans go day one what would happen to the empire state building um day you know 1000 what would it look like day 1 million day 10 million and then it basically shows you eventually with no humans the world just becomes this utopian you know paradise with palm trees everywhere basically and um, yeah and there was uh there was specific ones showing you like coral reefs and uh, yeah what happens to them and they they will grow back remarkably quickly um if we stop like blowing them up you know to make space for whatever or taking speedboats through them with tourists on like they will they will improve like real fast um but yeah we need to actually put the work in (laughs) to do that but um yeah this it's actually a cool documentary there's there there can be legislations i mean i don't want humans to die out i'm not a proponent for that but Mm. i am a proponent for legislation that leads to the you know the earth being protected and some of the some of that shit is so easy that we just need to agree as a, as a human being, as a species to say, look, let's stop using copper based paint. Let's stop mm-hmm. like using tin based paint because what happens is that ablative paint, you don't even have to like hit the coral. All you got to do is leave your boat on top of it for a day. And some yeah. of that ablative paint starts to fall off, you know, my, microorganisms. And as soon as any copper or tin hits coral, it dies. It, it, yeah, it just, yeah. It, it'll kill it. If you want proof of that, look at any marina and there's no coral inside marinas because the boats are all sloughing this shit paint. So we need to have a better way to like, you know, there's gotta be some other way to do it other than we're going to paint all this, all this really caustic crap on the boat that sloughs off when people, when things attach to it. So we don't have to go down there and clean it. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I think the issue is when it comes to problems like this is like the actual solutions for these problems, they don't sound incredible. They don't sound sexy. It's nothing a politician can like win an election on. Do you know what I mean? Like the stuff that isn't necessarily going to help by making everybody get an electric car within the next 10 years. That's really nice, but it's not going to save the oceans as much as they say it will. It's not going to have any massive impacts, not before, you know, serious problems start to happen, like with loads of coral reefs dying off. But yeah, small stuff like that, that could actually make a change, but it would require the entire planet to agree on something. Like, And that's the problem. Would, like, exactly. I, yeah. I've always said, if you're, if you're going to invent or innovate something, make something to make people lazier because yeah. human beings are in, inherently lazy and they don't want like, you're never going to get a product where it's like, 
hey, buy my product. And then you're going to have to clean your bottom three times as much. No one's going to buy it. But yeah. if you can invent something that's like, look, we're going to put Teflon on the bottom of your boat. You'll never have to paint it again. Yes, it's going to cost 20 grand, but it's fine for the environment because it doesn't slough off. Then you got like mm-hmm. somebody that's like, oh, yeah, that'll work. So all yeah. we need to do is just get better at that kind of thinking. But yeah, I, I, I totally get what you're saying, man. Uh, I mean, governments could put money into stuff like that, you know, they, and it would be worth doing, especially in, you know, Australia, for an example, that would be great. It's a, it's an insulated Island. They don't get that many boats just randomly coming into their waters. It's mostly shipping the odd sailing boat, that type of stuff. They could legislate that like super quick uh, where they could just like put money into, you know, that part of the industry that could go to all the companies that make anti-foul or bottom paint, um, you know, bottom paint, just say, listen, we want you to go in this direction is a massive chunk of cash. You know, put some put some effort into R and D and try and do it. The the crazy thing is, they don't even need R and D. They just need to copy one of these like local places yeah, that's already done it. Look at Bonaire. Yeah. Bonaire t- decided in the '60s that they were going to base their economy, their entire economy, on the water. So yeah. it's the number four dive destination in the world. There's legislation that that says that like no companies can dump anything, even on the Tierra or on the um, land. Sorry, I'm speaking Spanish. Um, uh, th- there's there's all these rules and regulations you you can't anchor there uh it's 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 very difficult to actually have a boat there um just because their entire economy is based on the beauty of their water all they have to do is just macro that out like okay what yeah. would work for costa rica what would work for ecuador that like you know you can't ab- absolutely do everything because all of their economy is based on the water tourism you can't just take that and make everybody's economy based on that so there, there would have to be some bending of that but that's the way to do it see where i think the r d needs to come in is they need to encourage the private sector players to make alternatives that are safer for the environment as cheap as the normal options that's how it's going to work because otherwise you'll have a situation like california where they over legislate like crazy to keep everything looking clean um, the place ends up costing a fortune because stuff costs so much money. It doesn't end up being that clean anyway, really. And it just makes people's lives harder. Like f- refitting boats in California is an absolute headache. Like I spoke to a number of people who were like, we have to go to like Nevada to buy paint. I'm like, what? And it's like, yeah, we have to go to like another state to buy glue. I'm like, this is crazy. Uh, so yeah, they need yeah. to like make it cheap and easy for people and then it will work. Because if it's the cheapest and the easiest option and it's good for the environment, like where's the negative in that? It's a no-brainer at that point. That's what they needed to make it for people is a no-brainer. Yeah. So yep. they need to put some work in. <laughs> oh, we need to make it work in Agreed. whatever way works. I mean, if you're going to subsidize something or put some money into something, maybe, maybe somebody should start a nonprofit where they, they are the ones that subsidize these things. You know, like, look, I've got all these donations. I've got $30 million. You know, I'm giving out money for people that buy uh, this product because it's, you know, I'll make it cheaper for you. It wouldn't be a bad idea. People people spend a lot of money on ocean cleanup. I mean, people could donate to you know like this company that's basically just subsidizing for people to make the right decisions with their boat. Yeah, you know, I don't think there's any massive organization like that. Like, you know, when it comes to like building water wells in Africa, there's go tos, or you know, like rebuilding Haiti, there was a go to for that. I, th- there is nothing for like generally just making the oceans cleaner like on a personal level there's lots of ocean cleanups but not do you know like little differences that will actually help like what you were just talking about the anti valve for example there's no maybe one really, you and i should like, start that up that. Bud. maybe mate, we're gonna have some spare time coming over from the azores i think we can yeah. we'll figure something out yeah let's talk no <laughs> shit i mean I'm, yeah, yeah it's just one of those ideas where all you got to do is put some put some effort to it and put some emotion to it and make it happen yeah, could how, work. right how, back to your story. Everything. So you are in Ecuador. Okay. Are you? I'm in Ecuador. No, oh no, no, I, I'm in Easter Island now. And then yeah. going through Pit, Pit Cairn, we went through all four Pit Cairn. Oh man, Pit Cairn was so amazing. We ended up spending a week there. We met uh, the guy that runs the only bar on the island, which his bar is basically like his den. And right. his name's Pi- <laughs> his name's Pirate he turned his mom's room into a bar. Right. They they've all the all the Pit Cairner. Uh, have um uh kiwi accents and i can't do the kiwi accent but they're funny as shit so this guy's huge and he's got like 27 earrings and he looks like a pirate he's like oh i'm a pirate and uh just so fun to hang out with and he's a rocker too you'd love him dude he 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 you guys would get along 
Um, so we spent like multiple nights. I ended up crashing at his house and just leaving my boat out on anchor and being like, well, if I lose the boat, at least I've got a good story. Um, uh, partying with this pirate in Pitcairn. That sounded kind of cool. Partying with the pirate in Pitcairn. Yeah. Um, so, and, and when I say that we got blessed by weather, we really did because right after we left, we got hit by this crazy storm. It was like three days of 45 knots. And I know of a guy, I met a guy in Gambia. Uh, just after we arrived there that like his life's dream was to go to Pitcairn and he spent 20 days sailing down there and then it got hit by this weather and they were waiting offshore and they couldn't do it and they tried to anchor and then they ended up hitting another boat and then you know oh, having to go to having to go to Gambier and it kind of got ruined and he's like well I got to see it and I'm like oh you don't want to hear my stories <laughs> um, I I will tell you guys one other one I um there was these kingfish there that were just freaking huge man like okay uh, i i told my girlfriend to get in the water and spear one of them and she comes up with this fish <laughs> the size of her i mean like yeah, it had say, to be yeah. like 40 pound kingfish and so i we're taking pictures of it with her you know and she's got it slung over her shoulder and shit and so we call my buddy and, and we're like hey bring your atv down here we got this huge fish we're gonna give it all away because we can't eat it and so I think we fed like six families that day. It was really good. I felt really, nice. really good about it. It's pretty neat. Um, they have a big turtle that lives there, like a huge gargantuan turtle that's 100 years old or something, maybe 80 years old, real famous turtle. Okay. We got to, we got to meet her. Um, and the, the volcano is so steep that it's, it's a workout living on that island. It's, it's a pretty cool place. There's only 50 people that live there. And if you don't know the story, it's the mutiny on the bounty is the story. So if you if, if you can go look okay. that up or watch the movie, the movie, it's a really really compelling story. And these are all seventh how, generation. How did the people end up on there? Was it like are these like colonial travelers, or was there indigenous people there and they are still there? And it's those indigenous people. Like how's it populated? The story's wicked, man. I'm, I'm I'll tell you a condensed version. So in the seventeenth. No, 18th century, 1700s, um, the slaves in the West Indies were running out of food. And so in okay. the Pacific, they have breadfruit. They didn't have breadfruit in the Caribbean. So they sent a boat, the British sent a boat out to go get breadfruit from the Caribbean and bring it back to the West Indies to plant it so the slaves could have something to eat. Um, on the okay. way, the, cap the captain was such a dick that the first mate ended up getting a, most of the crew together and they mutinied. Uh, after they got to Tahiti oh, shit. and they right. ended up, they ended up like telling a bunch of the Tahitians that they were going day sailing and stealing them too. And they set this guy, a, a, a sail, a sail, the, not a shore. They, they sent him out to sea in one of the dinghies. So he was in an 18 foot boat with 18 men. And at this time, that area was that region of the world was a little bit tribal and not safe for a bunch of European guys to just to show up. So they ended up sailing that dinghy 3,400 miles all the way back to Great Britain, and they didn't lose anybody. Pretty amazing. That is amazing. No huh? way. And the mutineers took the big ship, the Bounty, um, which is why they call it Mutiny on the Bounty, with their, their you know, women and, and slave men from, um, from Tahiti, and they've tried to find an island that they could live on, that they could basically take over and, you know, live out the rest of their mutinous lives alone. And they, they picked a couple of them and they got pushed out by the locals. So they found this island. They heard they, you know, everybody knew that this island existed, but nobody had ever really been there. Uh, mm -hmm. So they found this thing. And when you see Pitcairn, it's like, it's like Gotham City. It's like it, it's like one of those places that's just imposing and treacherous and it looks mean. And they rammed their boat aground, set it on fire, and ended up living there. And these guys are the seventh generation from these mutiny pirate people. Oh, no way. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, they're and actually descendants of the people who arrived on that boat. They're d direct descendants of the people that arrived on the boat. And That's all amazing. the places, all the places around the island are named like, you know, Jeff's Drop, because that's where Jeff fell off and died. Uh, stuff like that. <laughs> right, Adam, yeah. at, at, at the last guy that was alive from from all of the people on the boat was um, his last name was Adams. So the the name of the town that's there in the crater of this um, imposing volcano is Adams Town. That's the name of the town, and uh, it's an interesting place. Interesting people. Uh, the British ended up owning it because the, it was a British boat that got there, and Brit, Brits they ended up going there after that. 
they stake claim to it, and that's their only stronghold in um, the South Pacific. The Brits don't have anything else, so they end yeah, up yeah. subsidizing the people to live there and like giving you know they're, they're trying to make make it easy for people to live there. So they're giving a stipend to everybody, and uh, they basically just grow their own food. and It's very lush ground, but it's very rocky and and steep, and it's it's like this huge volcano with that blew up at one point and the and then in the crater is the only place that these people live it's insanely cool man you got to see it before you die yeah that sounds, okay that sounds so amazing yeah i'll check that out yeah and you, there's movies that have been made about this i think a couple called called mutiny on the bounty it's it's a great story yeah, or you can uh, watch the sailing zingaro youtube channel for the entire story <laughs> i can see it on there <laughs> I mean, we made a, of course, made a video about it. Got some really cool drone shots. Um, the guy that I told you, Pirate Paul, he ended up driving us all around the island and stuff. He, the, the people are there, cool shit. So we get done with there. We get hit by this nasty storm, and in this storm, it was so bad for us that we just set the autopilot and ran with it. We had so much sea room that we were just like, we'd come out and be like, "Oh God." just go back in because we couldn't see shit there's no reason to be outside so we were just like looking at the charts and be like okay hopefully we don't hit anything uh, luckily we didn't and that's how we rode out our pretty much our whole way to oeno and when we, when that storm was over we were right off the coast of oeno and we stayed there for another week spearfishing big fish it was amazing uh and then we did gambier tahiti while we were in tahiti we met a guy that lived in um he was from a, a, an island called my o and my O is also a really interesting island. It, it's called the Forbidden Island because they don't let tourists there anymore because there was a French guy that went there and started, he started a store and then he started giving people things on, on IOUs. And then one day, years later, he just calls in all the IOUs and demands all, the, the, all of their land. So this guy ended up owning like 98% of the island. And then he tried to sell the island to the same people that were doing... Um, Oh shoot! What are the what are they called? Phosphorus mining, and that basically like screws up the entire island. And the the locals were like, "Oh my God, what do we do?" And they called the government, and they're like, "You guys need to intercede here." So the government stepped in, paid the guy off, kicked him out of the island, and made it a commune island, and then made it so no no um, foreigners no are allowed to go. go in there. No one can ever go in there unless you're invited yeah. by the locals. And since we were taking one of their their own back, we were treated like royalty, and we got. A total tours of the island unfortunately this is the t like one of the times where we we did film it and we still have that footage but we ended up breaking up after the the wreck and we were like a year and a half behind so by the time we were all done with the breakup and stuff it's just it was too hard for us to go through that maybe one day later i'll, I'll put out that that stuff because it is so cool man the people there were yeah, awesome people would want to see that yeah i think so uh, the people there were amazing. The it was a really cool time. They 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 really use it's a community. They make their own. Um, they they make the palapa roofs for like all the big hotels in the world. They're really really good at doing that. They make it out of the bandanas leaf. It's mm. I have this all on video, man. I should I should go back and make those into videos. I think people yeah would you should make it. that man. Just 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 mm -hmm. as like a one off, like just show a really cool mm -hmm. place. That would be really good. Yep, yep. One day I still have it. Yeah. I have. I'm not gonna throw it out. So anyway, anyway, we spent like six months in, um, oh no, probably four months in, in Tahiti because we didn't have, um, we didn't have visas and they only give you three months. So I think we overstayed by about a month and uh, we had to leave because the, the cyclone season was coming. So we were like, look, let's go to the line islands and then go up to Hawaii, spend the winter in Hawaii while the cyclone season's going on down here. And then as soon as it stops, we'll go back down. We'll get another three months there and then we can just keep going. And that was the, our plan. But uh, so it took us two months from, to, to sail from Hawaii through all the line islands up to Hawaii. And by the time we got there, we were out of fuel. The boat was tired. Um, we were in the best shape of our lives. And that was one of the best adventures we had been on, on this trip. I felt I was in like three sailing magazines right then. Uh, I was writing for sale. I was, uh, I just felt like I made my, my YouTube channel was doing really well. Um, I, I, had, I, I felt like I was on top of the world. And then in one night it freaking ended it, because my boat broke and I lost everything. I, 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 well, I actually thought I did, but you know, hindsight, I should have just, stayed on track anyway i had lost my boat um my girl left right after that um you know 
I had lost my business because I, I had need a boat to have a sailing channel. Mm-hmm. So I went, I went into a really dark place after that. And it was really hard for me to pop back out and, and, and see, it took me like two or three weeks to be like, okay, what am I going to, what am I going to do about this? And, um, uh, so I started researching, um, crowdfunding because I've never done any crowdfunding. And I decided that like my story and this situation would be good for Kickstarter. A Kickstarter has a rule that you need to have a product. And I do have a product, my business, my, my sailing channel, it's a series and that's the product. So I, I spent 30 days, 30 freaking days. All I did was read books and research successful Kickstarter campaigns. Like what makes it successful? Like basically what it comes down to is you have to make a campaign that's very easily readable, like a four-year-old can understand. And you have to delegate where all the money is going to go and why you would like to, you know, people to help you make this thing. And if you can do that concisely through a lot of pictures, everything's JPG. There's no like text really. Um, you know, there's text in the JPG to explain the, the pictures, but basically it's all just pictures. Uh, you can, you can be successful on, on Kickstarter. So we had a really good story and we, and I actually elicited the help of a couple of other sailing channels, Ben and Ashley, Ben was um, amazingly helpful. I love that guy. Um, he, did you ever interview them yet? No, no, no. yet. From Nahoa. You gotta, you gotta meet those guys. They're so cool. Oh, I've watched, I've watched a couple of videos. They seem really nice. Yeah. Really cool people. So started the Kickstarter campaign, ended up racing 80 grand and, um, uh, used it to buy this boat. And when I bought this boat, I, um, I put my feelers out there with my, with my people. And I was like, look, I'm looking for a boat. I've got like right around a hundred grand. I can't, I don't have a dollar more than that. And I'd like something that's, you know, enough for a few people to be on that's comfortable, that's safe. I don't want another Crowther cat because I almost died on one. If I got on another one, it would, <laughs> I, you, you would be, you would be yeah. amazed at how many links I got for like the same kind of catamarans. And yeah. I did not, that's the last boat I wanted. Uh, now I'd probably take one, but at the time I was like, really, I had a little bit of PCSD. Keep for me away from it. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I ended up getting a call from this guy and he's like, look, I got this friend. Um, her husband died a few years ago. They have this boat that's been on the hard for a number of years in Curacao. They don't know what to do with it, that he, she, it has a lot of nostalgic factor for her, but you know, she needs to get rid of it. So why don't I just put you guys together? And so the boat wasn't even for sale. And I talked to the lady and she was like, yeah, I want this for it. And she wouldn't go down on the price. And I'm like, well, babe, you don't even realize how much work it's going to be to rebed everything thing and all the seals and all the rubber is going to be gone all the pumps and she just wouldn't budge so i ended up having to fly to her like on a whim kind of thing like i'm flying up there and i'm going to sit you down and i paid a guy to to go and take a shitload of pictures and i just showed her all the pictures and showed her all the work and told her that like look i'm the guy to do this I, your boat is going to end up in a trash can unless you get somebody that's that's you know coherent that knows what they're doing because this is a lot of work this is a huge job it ended up taking me 11 months to to get her into shape and then on her maiden voyage i almost sank it because the i I didn't (laughs) i didn't i didn't um change out i changed out all the through holes but i didn't change out the speed wheel just because i've had one of those on like every every boat you don't really think about that thing you just take it out okay good put it back in put the cap on well the the waves were so bad and the the current was, was was contrary and we took this big wave and it pushed so much energy up into that thing it broke the ring because the ring was old uh, 30, 30 years old. And it freaking opened up a, an inch and a half through hole. And at the time I, t- to be completely honest, I don't really know if I should say this or not, but I didn't, I hadn't bought insurance yet because I was waiting to like get off the hard and get into the water. And then, then I'd have insurance. And because I hadn't done that, my, my thought process was just totally screwed. I'm usually good in, in situations like that. Like after <laughs> years and years of being out, out on the water, you, you, you know, you can't just freeze. You just, you have to freaking act. But at the time, I'm like, I cannot believe I'm going to lose 800 people's money. I'm never going to be able to like have a YouTube channel be taken serious again. I am so <laughs> <laughs> seriously destroying boats everywhere. <laughs> oh my god, it was it was like the worst day. That was worse than ripping the cat in half. At least that was something that like wasn't really my fault. This was totally my fault. 
So I ended up like, you know, saving the boat and getting the water out. And now the floors in the boat are, are totally screwed. I got to redo the floors. That's, that's the main thing, but the water didn't get up to where it like screwed up any of the joinery or anything. I'm, I got really yeah. lucky. And I had really good friends that came down and helped me clean it all out because I got the boat in within like three or four hours. And then I, all my friends came down and we like hosed out the entire boat, took everything out and didn't cause any major damage except for the veneer on the floor. So, okay. So, so yeah, uh, that that's really funny part, but I really like this boat. It, I mean, not a lot of people go from, I think I got like 40, a little over 40,000 miles on that cat. And now I've got about maybe 10,000 miles on this boat. And uh, I like monoholes. I'm, I mean, I hadn't really sailed monohole very far before. And now that I've been offshore on this thing and seen the differences and, and the, the way that it moves, it's comfy, bro. It's nice not to have to like reef down and drag drogues and be worried about flipping the boat. I was always worried about flipping that cat. I mean, like yeah. all the time, even three years well. into it. Yeah, it was really light. And it just like I, yeah. could, I flew a hull a couple of times and it was just it, it was really easy to go really fast. And, and as soon as the wind like, you know, when at night, sometimes the wind will pipe up like you're, you're having a nice sail. It's 18 knots. And then at night it gets to like 20, 25 or something. And with that, with that light cat, it was like, it was like four or five knots difference. And that's a lot. That's a big yeah, change. Yeah. So I, I kind of like going, you know, eight knots everywhere or seven, you know, and, and I realized actually with this boat, this is a 48 foot boat. My, my other one was a 38 foot boat, but it was a cat. So the, the median speed is 6.7 with both boats, like over 10,000 miles. It's 6.7. That's and it's crazy because this one's way more comfortable for the 6.7. So Yeah, I was going to say, I, you probably feel like you're going slow in that, and you probably felt like you're going faster in the other one, even though it would have gone way quicker. Yeah, well, I would go faster all the time, a lot, but I wouldn't go faster as as a, like a mean speed. Yeah. So I would say I like monoholes better now, but that might change later. And I, I wouldn't. But you have to had, cool. you've got a very good example of a monohull. <laughs> yeah, 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 so, yeah, I've got yeah. It. Yeah. And that was on purpose. I know boats and yeah. I know oysters. And the plan was actually to buy this boat for an investment. Like I can get it, I can get it relatively cheap. Whatever money I put into it, I'll probably get back. Like that's a good monetary um, investment. But I didn't realize how much I would fall in love with their man. I really like this boat. I think this is one of the better ones I've ever even sailed on. I like it way better than my buddy's brand new Bavaria. I like it better than the Hansa 575. I like it better than the only boat I've been on that like compares to this one is, uh, is I took a Mason 64, 63 across the Pacific 21 days. That boat was equally as badass. It was just a work of art. Um, I've got that, a, a series of videos on that one. From a sailing perspective, like what, what makes this boat that you've got now so like unique and brilliant in your opinion? Like specifically the way it sails, the comfort of it, what difference do you think there is? I think I would have to be an architect to properly answer, answer that question for you. But I think that Holman and Pi, the people that designed oysters for a long time, with this boat specifically, and I've heard this from other people that are oyster fans, uh, they just got the bottom just perfect. Uh, yeah, they just the way made that, nice the, the way that the keel works, the way that the bottom is is shaped, the way that the rudder is hung, uh, the size of the rudder, the, the weight of the boat, the, the boat's full fiberglass, so it's a lot stiffer than a lot of other boats that are cored. Um, the, the height of the mast is, is perfect. The way that the sails work, I wish that this had slab roofing. I think it would go a little faster. But, I mean, I do eight knots upwind all the time. And yeah. I'm not even pushing the boat that hard. Uh, it's just the boat's nice. I like it. It's a little bit of a like a rich man's boat. So instead of being like an Amel that's that's made to be a sail a sailing boat and everything's kind of like pulled in a little bit and there's handholds everywhere and everything's kind of like you kind of tuck yourself into the seats and stuff. This is a way more mm -hmm. open boat. So it's more for like the, the aesthetic. Um, which is good or bad, depending on your preferences. You know, do you want to be in a big, huge open space in big seas? No, but if you know what you're doing and you're careful, you're not going to get thrown all, all around. I think it's there a good medium, do you know, like halfway 
to that point, like obvi- I mean, it's not like Bavaria's are massive inside. They, like yes. they are like you know, it's like going into a living room down there, and there isn't that much to grab onto. Oh, there is. You just have to take a walk to get to it. Um, exactly. Yeah, that's like, the problem. It's yeah. the walk. You don't <laughs> yeah, want to be doing the problem. That. Yeah, yeah. You crack your head while you're trying to hold on to something. Um, but yeah, and then like yeah, Mel's like you can get a fifty something foot of Mel, but like you've literally not got that much walking space. So I, I think that's like a great halfway point in between those two worlds. Like. I mean, you do want something that's comfortable and nice as well as something that's seaworthy. You know, if you are living on it, it it's, I mean, in my opinion, anyway, I, I sail, but I won't particularly class myself as like, you know, an offshore sailor by any stretch or I'm not a traditional sailor. You know, I would like to have a bit of comfort as well. And I, I think those types of boats are perfect for it. I think human beings are adaptable to whatever circumstances they're in. And I think, like I said before, whatever boat you have, you'll make comfortable for yourself. This one's very nice. It's got very nice joinery. It's 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 a rich man's boat. I think this thing costs like 1.1 million pounds in 93. So in 93, I'm, shit. Yeah, I'm very lucky yeah. to have it. I think it's one of the better boats that I've ever been on and I like I love the boat. But like everything, it's a trade-off, you know. I love Amels too. I've been on a, a quite a few of those Super Miramus. Those are bad boats, man. I w- I wouldn't um Mate, they're like tanks in the water. Like they yeah. will steam through yeah. any type of weather. They are so Those badass. Are, and I really like catch rigs too. That Mason that I threw yeah. across the pond was it was a catch. Uh, yeah, man. Um, let's see. I think I think we're almost to the point where we are now. Uh, I ended up taking this boat to Panama. I took it from Curacao to Aruba and Bonaire and did the ABC Islands a bunch of times and then took it to Panama. Went and hung out with Plucky from Sailing into Freedom, which I we we ended up being besties. And um, met Colin from Parlay and met um, Rick Moore from SSL, Met uh, went up to the um, boat show and met Brian. You just interviewed Brian, right? Um, Ryan from, from which? From Dallas. Oh, Brian. Yeah, I thought you said Ryan. Sorry. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Brian. Cool, cool dude. Um, yeah, very down to earth guys. Very chilled. I totally fanboyed out with him too. I was like, yeah. oh, you, you inspired me to get a boat and I've been sailing forever. And it was really funny. Yeah. <laughs> and then afterwards, so I was like, oh my God, I just did that to Brian Gray. Yeah. But I can imagine him just taking that so well, like laughing it off and just being like quite geeky he about totally it. Did. He's, uh, he's just a very nice guy. Yeah. 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 Super nice dude. Good energy. Uh, and then after Panama, I came, I, um, so when I, this is a hard story. When I was in um, Tahiti, we always had this porta boat. We left Florida and always had this shitty porta boat, and it had it had dunked my engine in the water so many times that I was on my second engine, and now this one broke down. And so we were like paddling this porta boat, even into Pitcairn. We had to paddle a porta boat into Pitcairn, and uh, I called. I was I was looking for companies that would give me a sponsorship, so I called a bunch of companies, and I got offered a few boats. Uh, but I really wanted an OC tender and I called this guy and I was like, oh, he's like, so you know nice. He was like, you that know what, so man, nice. even, even the Vagabond has, has, has wanted one of these things and we're just not set up for that kind of like throughput. So there's, there's no real reason for us to give them a boat because even if they, you know, like a million people wanted one, we wouldn't be able to build them. So, yeah. um, when we called him, it was just kind of a, a, a good timing for them where they, they were starting to make a lot of money. And well, not, I shouldn't say a lot of money, but they were, they were starting to like take off and to ramp up. Um, yeah. well, whatever money they made, they put back in their business. Um, they're, they're badass people. Uh, anyway, so th- they have Moonwalker, which is a very, very cool, fast daggerboard cat that they, they um, sailed around the world on for like six years and all very similar to my boat. And um, he was like, you're freaking real, man. I'm going to give you a dinghy. So he ended up coming up and there was hull number two of the OC tenders, like the second one he ever built. Uh, he, he had left there for like a marketing reason. And so he gave it to us. He, he revamped it. He helped us revamp it and puts new stickers on it and new tread on it and stuff. And then I, I did an interview with him and he's like, he's like, yeah, you take care of my boat, mate. And I'm like, are they all your boats? He's like every single one of my boat, man. It's just such a cool dude, <laughs> cool guy. Hasn't sold out, hasn't done any kind of like distribution, doesn't want to. He's like, whatever end user has problems, they talk to me. And that's the way I want it. And yeah, I mean, nice. like, I, I and now he's at the point where he could sell that business for like 10 million, I'm sure. But he doesn't want to. He wants it to be like, every boat's good. Every boat's mine. Every boat's touched by me. Every problem I deal with. I mean, 
I love his business model. Um, yeah, good philosophy. Yeah. Also, I just talked to him. So and anyway, he he offered me another boat. So it's it's me, Jimmy Cornell, and John John Florence that have one of these boats from him. Those are the only three people. I don't know how I got into that group, <laughs> but I feel very very lucky to be part of that society. And yeah. uh, I love I I love Russ. And so I, I, I got him to agree. He's never opened his factory for anybody. It's like no picture of policy. I got him to agree to take us on a, a tour of it uh, live. So that's happening in like a month. And then do a podcast with me because he's such a cool cat. You'll love it. You'll have to check him out, man. And then more people just need to know about these boats. They're the best boats ever. Yeah, they're incredible. We When we were in um, Martinique, there was a, oh, I think it was like a Lagoon 5 something, one of these ginormous hotel apartment things that floats. Yeah. Um, there was, uh, they had an OC tender on the back and they are so nice, but they are pricey. Like they're a couple of grand, aren't they? At least, I think. Yeah, they're they're, they're not cheap, but they last forever. I mean, the one well, that they, we got was- Yeah, they last, was, yeah. The one that we got in, in Tahiti was five years old. We had it for another year. And then we gave it back to them. It, it went across the pond again with another Kiwi sailor. And then he gave it back to the company. And now it's with a fisherman in New Zealand. And that's hull number two. So all these boats are still yeah. around. The, the problem is, like, I like to be a profession, uh, uh, perpetuate a, a green kind of lifestyle. And a lot of these dinghies, man, they end up in the trash, dude. I'd see a lot of yeah. them just garbage. So these ones don't. And that's another benefit. And I, I sound like such a... a a salesman but this isn't even like i'm not getting paid for this i just love these tickets i'm so excited to have this thing. yeah they are cool i think yeah. if it's like if you've just bought a boat and you're planning on a circumnavigation and you're going to be on it for like 10 15 years i would be like yeah then buy one of those because that will actually last you that long you have to well, go around replacing it every too. two years you, you yeah, can you, you can could, resell yeah. them and they're they don't lose their value that much they're a proper boat it's like buying a, a real boat that's the difference um yeah, I mean it's a it's a little bit of an investment, but you know those um, those AB ultralights are almost the same price. Yeah. And the yeah, problem with true, those, yeah. the problem with those aluminum boats is the aluminum starts to oxidize, and then it gets underneath the glue for the hypalon glue, and then it starts yeah. leaking. The water starts leaking in, and then it's really hard to fix. So yeah. there's problems. There's pros and cons with everything, just like every single decision in boating. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point, actually. As soon as that, yeah, because um, a, couple, a couple of my friends, they've got that issue at the moment. It's like starting to pit and a few little tiny cracks, not cracks, you know, micro holes. So it's leaking, but then it started to happen around the seals where the tubes are as well. And then, yeah, it's leaking through that area as well. So it's a bit of a pain. So what's the plan, mate? Like, what, what is going on next? Uh, I wish that I could tell you the finish of this story, man. I've got this idea, <laughs> this million dollar idea. That is going right. to rock the world, but I can't tell you that yet. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's going to be, yeah, I, I, it's going to be super fun and I'm, I'm doing something different and um, I'm going to end up selling the, the oyster. Unfortunately, I've, I'm going to cry. I know it. I cried the day I sold Zing. Um, I put a lot of my heart and soul and blood in this boat. But basically, we're going to go to Cuba for like one last hurrah. I'm meeting a bunch of boats there. It's going to be super fun. You're, you're more than welcome to join me if you'd like. I'm um, going to spend a Isn't month it? going through southern Cuba. And then I'm going to go up to Florida, replace the floors, replace the cushions. My mom's driving down in her motorhome. Actually, I'm flying up and I'm going to drive her motorhome down. And then she's going to live next to the boat. And this is the fourth boat that we've done together. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, redone all the cushions. So it's kind of like a thing that we do. She's a sailor, too. Um, I got her into sailing, actually. And then as soon as the boat's all pristine and nice and I get, you know, everything the way I like it, I'm going to sell her and use the money to, for the next venture. And I can tell you that it's going to be a new build. It's going to be a boating. A new build. Yep. Intr complete new build. Yep. Like you are putting the fiberglass shells together or are you actually, is, are you thinking like plywood? How new build? I can't, you're, you're, you're trying oh, to get too much info on. out of me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody will guess it if you go too deep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't want to give it away. It's going to be super fun. It's going to be one of those yeah. things that's worth the wait, you know? Yeah, mate, I love watching that stuff. There's um there's a sailing uh, channel on YouTube called MJ Sailing. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, they're, um, they're building a cap. Exactly, yeah. That's so cool to watch. Like, they've literally just taken all of the components and they're just doing the job that a normal boat factory would do. And putting it together but it's so interesting to watch. massive projects like huge jesus i'd never take on something like that 
um yeah, but yeah but that, really I mean, interesting everything in life is a um is like a scalable thing right so they did one boat and then sailor tried the pacific and then found a bigger boat did it did that boat like a complete yeah. refit like take, taking the entire interior out and now it's just like kind of in the next step like okay well we'll just build a boat and mm. i think that was a financial decision too because once they're done they're going to have a seven hundred thousand dollar investment uh, for something that they didn't spend seven hundred oh, yeah. grand on um uh, and yeah. plus it, it's a cat and plus it's going to be new and plus they can make it the same way it's it's the, basically the same decisions that i'm doing the this but mine's going to be different so are you thinking of like seeing the season through in the Caribbean and then selling the boat and starting your new project? I was going to do that, but right. I just got this offer from my buddy on the Bavaria to take the Bavaria off. And the, the like May, June is the best time to do that. So now yeah. I'm just going to go straight. I might stop in DR to see a couple friends and maybe do a podcast with Bobby from sailing doodles. But, um, I, I'm basically, I want to go to Cuba again while I, while I'm here. Um, mm -hmm. And, and then I got to get the boat to Florida. I'm going to leave the boat in Florida, get on the Bavaria, go across the, the pond in the Bavaria, get, have the, have the last, you know, rager in Ibiza, fly back, work on the boat for a few months and then put it for sale and um, then start my next, my next thing. And then I'll announce what I'm doing but I can't right. do it now. <laughs> well, mate, you've picked, a, you've picked a pretty good place to have your final rager. Uh, I mean, if you're going to go anywhere in Europe for a rager, uh, Ibiza is probably the spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My life is blessed, man. I, I, I really, I have good people around me and, and I have great fans and I have great, like, uh, this is, I can't believe that I've been doing this this long and it's only possible by other people watching me, supporting me. It's pretty cool. And I love sharing it. So That'll be all documented too. And I'll have some really cool people. I got I got a couple of cool people that want to come out on that journey with the Bavaria. Yeah. Yeah, but you've worked hard for it, mate. And you know, you've shared the experience with everybody and you know, you you keep good company, good friends. Like that's that's what happens. Good things happen, you know. Yeah, yeah. I would yeah, we should cultivate this relationship because uh now we have now started a nonprofit and had had plans to sail from Azores to Ibiza. So we're, we're gonna we're gonna be buddies we're getting there <laughs> and <Ibiza. laughs> now i'll shall show you some places i've spent a bit of time there you'll like it <laughs> cool cool can't wait right well listen man thanks for sharing your story with our listeners it's um it's fascinating like you've you know you've done a bit of everything you've uh, you've been a little bit of everywhere it's a brilliant story and i wish you the best of luck well mate and uh, i look forward to seeing you in the summer it seems yeah pleasure i hope to see you on the boat and uh thanks for having me on the podcast much love my friend very welcome. Cool.